Uh, so again, my name is Shashank Srinivasan. I run a small startup based out of Goa, India called Technology for Wildlife. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about choosing the right drone for conservation. All right. So this is a conservation specific presentation, but only in parts. Like actually, again, because we're talking mostly about off the shelf drones, it, it applies to other people working in other sectors as well. And uh, we've done similar stuff for NGOs working on humanitarian issues. We're helping them to choose the right drone as well. Uh, so again, this, this particular presentation is specific for conservation, but it has broad applicability. So Tech for Wildlife, what we do is we amplify conservation impact. You've got uh, the, we're available on my front. So where are the markers that they could post? Uh oh, is somebody is somebody not Sorry, muted? I've is that what's happening? I think there is. Yeah, I'm, I've sorted it. Don't worry. Okay. Carry on. Sorry about that. that. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry. All right. Uh, am I still on slide share? Yep, you're okay. Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. All right. Okay. Oh, All right. hang on, Shashank. We uh, okay, yeah. Good. yeah, you're fine. Great. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so essentially we amplify conservation impact, which means we work with lots of small NGOs, uh, companies all over the place who are doing conservation work, and we actually help them amplify their conservation impact. And we do this through the, the use of the appropriate modern technology. So essentially we consult uh, on what, what would be best and then actually help them take it forward as well. Uh, one of the biggest parts of my role right now is telling people no. Um, so they're like, can we use a drone to do X? And I'll be like, no, that's that's not a good use of drones. Um, and that's a large part of the consulting work we actually do at this point of time. Uh, the two areas of work we work uh, specialize in are geospatial data analysis and robot operations. So one area is uh, again traditional GIS, lots of conservation specific GIS again, but with like satellite imagery, with uh, open data, with proprietary data as well. And uh, again, a lot of recent work with drone imagery and then we do robot operations. And again, we aren't specializing only in the use of UAVs. We also use some underwater uh, submersible robots, which I'll tell you more about in a bit. Uh, so again, uh, just in brief about what we do, why we use drones, among other things, we provide research and consulting services and we, we execute projects. So I'll just give you an example of one of the projects we did in 2019. Again, we had an extension planned in 2020 as well, but then the pandemic hit the lockdowns. Again, all of that work has been postponed to either late 2021 or 2022. Uh, so this project was called Machine Perspectives of Alien Landscapes and it was supported by two grants from uh, the NGS. Um, so the project itself consisted of visiting a set of high altitude lakes in Ladakh in September and um, in August, September 2019. Uh, we used underwater and aerial robots to explore lake ecosystems and look for signs of uh, pollution in the lake itself, primarily plastic pollution. The conservation outcomes for this project were quite clear. Um, we needed media uh, for advocacy. We needed uh, to collect data as well on the plastic itself. Uh, we need to engage with the community, show them how they can actually, uh, you know, if people are using drones or uh, robots around them, what they could be using them for, uh, and to actually help plan conservation activities as well. Uh, again, with drones, one of the primary outputs we got were like lots of beautiful landscape images, like almost 4,000 of them in total. Um, and again, this, this, this particular project consisted of visiting some beautiful landscapes. Uh, we also look, look for plastic, um, so sort of a bit of manual detection. Uh, we worked with a small um, university team to actually set up some image, image recognition for us as well to actually help uh, find plastic in these drone images itself. Uh, we created lots of high resolution maps from uh, the imagery we got from these drones and uh, then you know mapped it out. Again, we could use it to uh, look for plastic. Uh, the image on the right in particular was shared with another team uh, who are working on rodents, so primarily pikas in the area. So they use this to actually look at pika and marmot burrows. Uh, so again, all like side products are actually looking for plastic, but again, using robots to explore ecosystems. Uh, lots of community engagement work as well. So while we were operating the drones, if there were communities nearby, we went, showed them the footage, the imagery we were collecting, um, actually spoke with them about the use of drones in the area, about what they felt, uh, how they would be impacted by them as well. Uh, talked about the plastic, about tourism. Again, lots of interesting engagement points, primarily because we had this interesting tech which we could actually show them something with.
so the robots we used for this project, we had a DJI Mavic 2 Pro, uh, which we again we named them all. So this one is called Arva, uh, and then we also have a Sofar Ocean Trident, which is a submersible robot, which we called Varaha. Um, Underwater robot was used again for uh, surveys in the lakes itself, so actually looking for plastic in the water. Uh, and also have a short video here, if it plays, yes, which um, is of the small crustaceans which are found in the lakes itself. Uh, and again, from what I know, this is the first footage of these crustaceans from these lakes. Uh, similar work has been done uh, on the Chinese side of the Tibetan plateau, but again, for India, this was a first in my, from my understanding. So again, so these lakes are at about 4,500 meters above sea level. Uh, so diving in these lakes isn't really possible because of the pressure differential, like it's a really high risk activity. Uh, so again, having a robot go in meant that there's little or no to human life. Um, they're really small robots as well, so not invasive. Uh, and actually get some interesting footage we can, which we can use for conservation planning uh, in the area itself. Why use a robot for conservation research? Well, the two reasons again which we have for doing this is because robots can make conservation research more effective and efficient. So I like this combination of words of it being effective and efficient because uh, in one case it's possible with robots to do tasks which were earlier being done slowly, faster, uh, and in the other it's being it's, you can actually do tasks which weren't possible earlier. Uh, so those are the two reasons again like which robots are really powerful for and especially in an extreme environment uh, you know like um, but if you're using uh, if you're doing marine research where the tides are really strong if you are working at high altitude where there's again there's not much oxygen so your breathing is difficult so you can't like do as much labor uh, using robots that actually reduces both risk to life as well as the physical effort involved in conducting field surveys uh, we're almost at the point where you can use robots to conduct transit work again there's you can't really replace like having a skilled person on the ground running a transect, looking at uh, feces, looking at um, any kind of disturbance in the area, but it's not that's not very far away, right? But uh, again, in cases where the risk, the effort components outweigh the efficacy of the work itself, it might make more sense to use robots. So what robots do we use at this point of time? Uh, and again, I'll talk more about this in the Q&A uh, towards the end of this as well. But at this point of time, we have four or five robots with us right now. So we have a DJI Mavic 2 Pro, a Phantom 3 Advanced, which came out in 2014 or 15, uh, a Sofar Ocean Trident, uh, and we have two of them. So we got one two years ago for a project, and we're getting another one from a WCS grant sometime hopefully next week if the customs duties work out correctly uh, to actually do some coral reef mapping and we also have an open rov 2.8 as part of a moore foundation grant in 2016 uh, which had to be built from kit uh, so that robot is currently defunct it's uh, lots of moving parts it's 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 kind of uh, not the most reliable in the water uh, again but it is four years old so we're, we're, we're currently a project I've given to a student is to actually refurbish the robot and get it operational again with any any add-ons uh, he wants to put onto it. So how do I choose a drone uh, for my work? Uh, well, these are the fact the list of factors which I currently have, all right? Which is the portability, the price, the technical specifications, the permissions, the ease of use, the longevity, and the repairability. Okay, so this is again no particular order. This is just something I keep in mind when I'm looking at, at purchasing a robot. Um, again, and I can adapt this list for almost any equipment which I'm interested in procuring. Uh, and again, the important bit is that there is no particular order. I'm not going down a tick checklist of, okay, this is priority one, priority two. There is a balance between all these factors which I need to find before I can decide whether the drone is the right fit for me or not. So again, what do we use the drones for? I use them for photography and videography. Uh, we do pure mapping work with them and we also do training exercises. We don't use drones currently for tracking wildlife, um, which I know is a big part of conservation research uh, in other countries. Um, but for us in India right now, conservation research with drones, with satellite imagery is primarily around actually just doing pure mapping. 
uh, one of the main reasons is just eco ecological. Like um, again, I have colleagues, friends in Kenya, uh, South Africa, who is, who's drawn to track wildlife. Again, the open savannas, the open grasslands are a very different landscape from India's mostly dense uh, canopy cover. So it's hard to actually use them to do any work with elephants um, or tigers for that matter. Again, to go back to the drones itself, based on what I do with them, uh, again, we're not following wildlife itself. Uh, we use primarily DJI, uh, the Mavic 2 Pro. And um, again, I'll come back to this later as well, but my recommendation at this point of time is if you need a quadcopter, there's something to do, you're going to be going most probably with a DJI Mavic drone, one of, one of the many ones in the series. Uh, the reasons, again, I use the DJI drones for the project in Ladakh, which I showed you earlier, which uh, I use them for most of the work now, is because it's highly portable. Uh, they can be carried almost anywhere. I, I normally have them on a sling bag around my shoulder, uh, and the even smaller ones can go into like a jacket pocket. Uh, the price, it's usually better. Again, for the, for the price, it is more effective than anything else on the market in general. Uh, there are caveats to that, of course. Uh, the technical specifications, again, they can, the software limited to about 500 meters um, above ground level. They have got good cameras uh, and they can stay up for over 20 minutes at a time. Permissions are complicated. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, ease of use, they're really easy to use. Even training people how to use one is quite straightforward. Uh, like I mentioned, we use a Phantom 3 Advanced as well. That's easy to crash. The Mavic 2 Pro, you have to really struggle to crash it. Like you actually have to turn off a bunch of uh, fields in this uh, safety features and then actually really try and crash it and it doesn't want to crash all right it's got very smart obstacle avoidance on board and uh, yeah which works really well a longevity the mavic series on average are lasting about um, two to three years before they become obsolete before the new ones come out and uh, they completely they're not really useful anymore our phantom 3 for example like i mentioned has no obstacle avoidance at all while the mavic 2 does so for any project at this point of time, I'd normally just use the Mavic 2 just because it's got the obstacle avoidance built in. Uh, and finally, the repairability. And that's really important because uh, if a drone crashes, if you need to replace a component, even if you just need new batteries, you want to make sure you can access them. Otherwise, your entire initial investment in the device is uh, lost. And again, I'll just show you the next slide as well, which is about how DJI currently dominates the market. All right, so it's currently Again, high quality, great te technical specifications, easy to use. Uh, and again, like like I put at the bottom of the slide, because I'm I'm we're not technology evangelists, so I wouldn't push anyone to use only only one company's devices. But again, as of 2021, it is DJI which dominates the market for off-the-shelf consumer level drones. The main con again, which we are facing in India, I know people in the US may have similar issues as well, uh, is that DJI is a China headquartered company, so permit and import are quite complicated. So for example, this is a slide, um, again, an email conversation I had in December with some DGI support representatives. Our two of the batteries I use for the drone have swollen and they're lithium polymer batteries, so they can't really be refurbished. They need to be uh, discarded and they're quite expensive. In India, one of the batteries is coming for about 13,000 rupees, which is equivalent to about 180 US dollars. Uh, while well in the US, they sell for about $145, $150 a piece. Again, because this is a manufacturing defect in terms of the battery swelling, DJI agreed to replace the batteries, uh, but they had to ship them to either Dubai or Singapore. Uh, luckily enough, I've got friends and family in both city states, which wasn't a problem. So again, I have uh, currently like family in Dubai who've got two of my batteries them and they'll come into India whenever they come in eventually. But these companies can't ship directly to India, which is which is complicated. Recommendations, uh, I would say that if a quadcopter works for your purposes, you're probably best off buying a small DJI drone. Uh, there are larger ones as well, but again, I don't think they meet my requirements in terms of portability and price. Uh, but if you need something for a specific task, there's always niche of the self solutions available. And there's also the option of just having a drone drone custom built. We've explored the option of having drones custom built and it really doesn't work out very well because um, there's, unless you're in close contact with the person making the device, unless they're part of your team, um, 
if anything goes wrong, it's it's a, it's quite a lot of trouble to actually get it fixed. And again, even just ensuring that it is compliant with all the regulations which are in place currently for drone use uh, makes it a very complicated matter. And this has changed massively from say four or five years ago. So even five years ago, there were lots of people who were building custom drones who were actually selling them to customers. Um, and the market is really contracted. And the best analog for this is to look at the computer industry in the 1960s and 70s in terms of how it was hobbyist and then it went into uh, you know large corporates and again today you got microsoft dell apple lenovo yeah that's that's pretty much you know like that, that, that covers most of the computer market at this point of time so there might always be the demand for custom built solutions but the market is dominated by off the shelf drones and from a conservation uh, perspective that's really important because with limited budgets uh, buying off the shelf is going to be cheaper than getting something custom made, especially now when the technology has matured quite significantly. So again, the small DJI drones, uh, we've got the Mavic 2 Pro on the right, which is what I use. Again, really enjoy using the device. Uh, they have the Mini and the Air. Both of them are now the Mini 2 and the Air 2, and these are uh, really nice devices. So the Mini 2 in particular is Again, the sensor isn't as good as the in the Mavic 2 Pro, but in terms of the specifications, it's near identical for something which is half the size, which is quite impressive. Again, I talked about niche off the shelf customized drones. There are quite a few of those around. So if you're doing large scale mapping, and again, this is not from personal experience. This is from what I know from uh, researching the drone industry, from talking to people who actually do mapping work, is that, um, you know something like this, which is the Wingtra fixed wing drone, apparently is a quite a uh, it's quite 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 useful in the field. Uh, so it takes up vertically. Um, again, it's supported by its two twin tail fins by the support struts on the edge of each wing, but it, so it takes up vertically like a quadcopter and then flips over uh, once it's uh, aloft to actually operate as a fixed wing drone, collecting images uh, below it. So. The advantages of a fixed wing drone over a quadcopter that they can stay up longer, uh, that um, they can fly uh, faster and over longer distances. But again, the cons are going back to my list is about like how portable they are and how expensive they can be. Uh, with fixed wing, at least cost wise in India, uh, they're competitive with quadcopters for what they can do, uh, but they're not portable at all. You need like a small car, a vehicle of some kind to take them into the field. Uh, on that note, the other commonly used fixed wing drone mainly for mapping also for some wildlife surveillance work which I know of is the Sensefly EB. Uh, so this is based out of Switzerland. It's a fixed wing drone uh, can be hand launched. Um, again, it's not cheap. It's quite, it's, it's about, I, I remember right the last I got, last time I got a quote, it was about 7,000 euros. Uh, but again, I'm not sure what the prices are at this point of time. Uh, but again, quite an effective fixed wing drone for mapping purposes. And then we have this one, which is again, I think something I really want to pick up at some point of time, more just out of curiosity. It's the Power Vision Power Egg X, and it came up when I was looking for waterproof drones. The reason I want waterproof drones is that here in India, I am constrained by the monsoon season. So I can't operate any drones at all over the monsoon period just because of the water risk. There are times when the winds are low, but there's still a lot of humidity, a lot of moisture. Again, so drone work, at least where I'm based in Goa at this point of time, uh, doesn't happen between June and November. Uh, this particular drone is waterproof, uh, can also apparently also land in the water. Uh, so we have ex ex plans to experiment with it to actually look at whether we can, uh, you, you know, take photographs of seagrass, which is close to the surface using a drone which hops uh, onto the water surface, takes a photo while the camera submerged and then moves to another site. Uh, this particular drone is just interesting because it apparently also becomes a handheld camera, a tripod camera or a quadcopter depending on the attachment. So again, nifty little device, but just an example to show you how bizarre the drone market can get, but also uh, what's available out there in terms of customized options. Uh, so finally, to close with this section is that okay so my next drone i'm trying to figure out which one to get between these two um so on the the idea for rhino uav is an in indian built uav uh, which is capable of staying up for about 40 minutes um weighs under two kilograms and is mainly for mapping purposes 
And on the right is the Mavic Mini 2, which I've uh, again, it's quite a sweet device. It goes into a jacket pocket, uh, can go about eight kilometers away from you, and again takes uh, imagery or video, takes video at 4K. So the main thing again between these two devices is that the Indian built one is compliant with Indian regulations, while the DJI isn't, uh, and that's probably going to be the decisive factor. Uh, so again, to go back to that list uh, of priorities, I would say that you know no matter how much I might think the Mavic Mini 2 is going to be best for my purposes, it just might not be feasible to use it uh, in India over the next few years, which is why I might have to get the Rhino UAV, which is again much bigger, much heavier, but is compliant, compliant with permissions. And that's the kind of trade-off which you're going to have to balance constantly while looking at purchasing drones. I'm going to close with these three quotes. Uh, I use them, uh, I keep them in my head all the time. Uh, so one is by Arthur C. Clarke about any sufficiently advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic. And that's uh, again very true with drones at this point of time. These devices are amazing. They haven't, uh, again, the kind of drone we're using today, uh, if you showed someone in 2005 this and said you can do this, you can use this to actually do conservation work, they would be astonished. Um, again, the William Gibson quote, the father of cyberpunk, is about the future already being here and just not being evenly distributed. Again, very true with drones. In India, we show lots of people the drones when they're working in rural, rural India. Lots of them have seen drones before, but again, they, they don't dream of accessing them. And that's something we're trying to change in terms of having farmers use drones to actually, uh, you know, monitor human wildlife conflict on their farms to actually mitigate it if possible. Uh, and finally, the thing about all these drones, they need to be used ethically because again, the tech is only used to amplify what humans intend or are capable of doing. Uh, and that's really important to keep in mind even when buying a drone in that if you buy a really large invasive drone, then the communities who uh, you're going to be working around uh, may have something to say about that. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it for the presentation section. So we can move on to Q&A and a discussion at this point of time. Uh, but I'm Shashank at techforwildlife.com. That's our email address and we're on Twitter and Instagram as well. So again, all these platforms, you can reach out to me on any of them. All right, thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Shashank. That was such a great talk. Um, we are moving on to the Q&A now. So um, we have some of our questions already uh, ready to go in our data wrapper. If you guys think of more questions as we get started, feel free to drop them in there or ask them directly in the chat. Uh, Rob, you are up first. It looks like you got a lot of answers to this in the chat, but why don't you go ahead and ask it anyways, because I think this conversation will still be interesting. Ellie, is that right? Yes, go ahead, Rob. Hi, Shashank, great talk. Um, really interesting use of the drones. I think this, the plastic spotting stuff is really interesting. I um, I have never used the Mavic and I was just wondering, is it able to carry any kind of additional payload, like a small thermal camera or something like that? Or is it just too small for something like that? So the Mavic 2 Pros, uh, they have an enterprise version as well. Uh, which can have a thermal camera fitted onto it. Those enterprise versions are more expensive than the regular consumer level version, um, but that is possible. What they've done there is they just swapped out the entire camera payload for another camera. Uh, so that, that does exist already. It's again, it's one of the niche DJI drones. Modifying the drones itself, I know I know people have modified Phantoms, uh, Phantom 3s, Phantom 4s as well, uh, changed the entire camera module on the drone, uh, but if you wanted to add something onto a Mavic, you could tinker with the camera itself. Now, I wouldn't recommend that. And again, you might want to do it only with a device which is defunct, which is not being used otherwise, because you'll A, void the warranty, and B, these are highly integrated devices. So uh, you break one thing, you don't know what else you're going to be breaking while doing that. Uh, but it is possible to remove the IR filter from most consumer level digital cameras, so they actually can uh, shoot in infrared as well. Again, not thermal, but like IR. So it works well for vegetation and for uh, photography later. Uh, but yeah, if you want uh, thermal on a Mavic, you're best of going with the DJI uh, integrated enterprise model. Okay, okay, thanks Shashank, that's great. Uh, okay, 
Next up, we have David. David, it looks like you do have a mic, so go ahead and uh, take it away. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so I'm wondering if you think in the sort of near future-ish drones will be a viable platform for not just carrying equipment, but like deployment and retrieval of sensor packages in kind of remote, unaccessible areas, you know, kind of packages in the like 50 to 100 gram range. Okay, so I think that's a really interesting application for them. Uh, Rules regarding dropping things from drones are quite complicated right now. Again, like in India, it's not like drone, it's like linked to drone delivery, right? Like, which is why mm -hmm. Amazon and stuff haven't been able to scale up drone delivery because it's again, you have these little flying robots dropping things all over the place, uh, which is not quite something it needs to be regulated quite intensively. Uh, that aside, it's quite a feasible application for it. A similar one I know, which is um, is I think in 2015, this team in the UAE who used drones to pick up data from camera traps. So they set up the system where the camera traps were, uh, you know, they had some kind of Wi-Fi uh, wake up module on the camera traps. So when a drone flew into range, they would transmit the data itself to them. It's not a far leap from there to actually having drones drop off cameras in canopies and then picking them up later. Uh, I just think the, yeah, again, it's not, it's not, uh, unfeasible at all. It's just a matter of the tech. The tech itself is in place. It's a more about the policy, like enabling that. Great. Do you do you know the name of the team? The team in the UAE. They won the drones for good award in 2015 with WWF. Okay. I'll, I'll, Dubai, I'll look them up. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. And um, next up, we have Shanak. Is that right? Are you there? If you can't get your mic on, I will go ahead. I can ask it for you. Okay, I will go ahead and read it. I don't know if he or she um, is still here. Uh, can a Mavic Pro be used effectively for mapping coastal habitats, for example, profiling shores? So, uh, short answer, yes, it can. Uh, it's great for actually mapping out shorelines uh, for any kind of terrain. Uh, what we would do with the Mavic again for all our mapping work um, with any drone in this context is it fly it along a grid pattern of some kind along the shore you want to profile, take all the images, put them into some kind of drone image stitching software and then after that um, actually you'll have a ready, you'll have a geotiff, uh, some kind of map uh, out there at the end of it. Uh, I didn't need to mention it in my presentation, but I might just go through this quickly as well, is our drone tech stack in that sense. Uh, because we have all these drones we use, and again, the, the images we collect from them, we can just merge them all together. So we use um, something called Web ODM, which is a web-based uh, open drone map to actually stitch images together into the maps itself. And then we use QGIS to process the geotiffs and to do any kind of GIS work on that itself, right? So that's our drone stack essentially. Uh, we control the drone itself, the DJI drones with the with some with Pix4D mapper. So that's an Android and iPhone app to actually control drones. So between the three of them, we can actually do all our mapping work, right? And again, it, whether it's coastal habitats like Shauna Cast, whether it's any other kind of uh, terrain, we, we can map almost anything now with, 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 this, with this particular tech stack. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Carly, you are next. Hi, yeah, I, just kind of a, a follow up to that previous um, question about the using drones to transfer data at, from devices like camera traps or um, passive acoustics. I know you mentioned that like UAE team, but that's what I would, I, I do passive acoustic monitoring, so not having to hike at, in like the jungle of Madagascar. So not having to hike around the jungle in Madagascar would be great. Um, if I could just fly a drone over and, you know, a LoRaWAN gateway or Wi-Fi, blue, I don't know, something wireless um, could connect it. I think David's just posted that, um, a link to that team you mentioned, but is that, I mean, do you have any other experience with that or like how one could get that to like, how do you load 
that device, um, sorry, or the gateway or whatever onto the drone and things like that? So something with like with, with sound, if you wanted to look at actually mapping out, um, you know, passive acoustic work um, aerially, I would say like it might be best to look at something like a balloon or a remote Zeppelin, um, you know, these small devices or so something I've been quite intrigued by is actually putting our devices onto kites. Uh, so like kite aerial photography is very much something which we're interested in. I've been sending these GoPros off into the sky uh, linked to a kite. And again, it's really the, the, the mic is mostly picking up uh, sound, uh, the wind in a sense, right? But again, if you had your if you have the right noise cancellation, if you have the right uh, microphones, which are maybe directional, you could actually do a lot of work with kites or with balloons in that sense, uh, as opposed to drones specifically. That's, I, that's I, I more meant the devices are deployed on the ground, but so like you go out once to deploy them, the devices are on the ground, but you're then using a drone to just get transfer data from the on the ground devices. Right. So yeah, so. that that I, uh, there's wildlife drones out of Australia. Uh, that's what they, they they got some funding last year, like startup funding, and they're doing something similar with radio callers, uh, where they the, again they they followed animals and then the drones pick up the signals and the radio callers so that they don't actually have to do any uh, satellite based iridium uh, Argos. They don't have to pay for those services essentially. Uh, so that kind of stuff already exists. It's from what I can make out is usually. So it's not Bluetooth because of the range, but it is some kind of LoRa WAN uh, in that context. And it's essentially operated by when uh, the drone comes into range, it triggers off the, 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 the transceiver on the ground is uh, woken up essentially and then transmits data to the drone itself. Um, it's essentially like a, it's similar to what uh, I think Google was trying to do with balloons in New Zealand in terms of providing internet access over large distances, uh, so that those those tech they, they vary quite a bit. But uh, yeah, LoRaWAN is what I I know of as working most effectively in that context. I think I'm next. Hey, um, I, hey, Shishang. Um, I just wanted to ask. A, we had a heap of questions coming through um, during registration that were really interesting, and I just wanted to throw one at you that. Um, that I, I thought was particularly interesting. Um, where do you see the technology heading next? Um, now that more brands other than DJI are, are popping up, um, like Autel, will we see more innovation? What do you think? So everyone's talking about swarm drones, and I don't know quite know what we're going to do with swarm drones specifically. Again, our work with drones around mapping what we have right now works really well right um, in terms of actually mapping out stuff but if people are looking at actually tracking wildlife uh, if you have drones which for example land an animal inject it take off again you know again miniature is mini it's all becoming smaller uh, which is definitely a component of it um, but also in a sense it needs to become easier to use like the people we work with in you know at ground level um, in the field they need to have devices which are really easily repairable, which they can use very easily and which if they break it, they don't go bankrupt because they've broken it, right? So it's going to, I think that's that's definitely one direction aside from innovation in terms of getting the tech better. It's just in terms of getting the tech more accessible. And I think that's that's definitely a direction it's, which will benefit conservation to some extent. Cool, thank you. All right, and next we have um, Kashish. And it looks like you also have a mic, so go ahead and ask. Yeah, hi Shashank. Uh, regarding the uh, so far trident, just wanted to understand uh, the major uh, problem is the uh, strong currents. So is is it something which which is able to propel in that scenario, or or there are some other uh, possible uh, underwater ro robots as well who can withstand like which can uh, withstand these strong currents. So there are quite a few underwater robots now in the market. Uh, so something called the Blue ROV as well. There are uh, actually quite a few available. Um, even the, the company I mentioned, Power Vision, who make that Power Egg, that really nifty little underwater floating quadcopter thing. Uh, they also have a dolphin submarine of some kind, which is also like a ROV. The currents are going to be a factor because at these price levels, you look talking about a small device with small motors and small batteries. Uh, so there's going to be a limit in terms of what you can actually do with them in the water. 
Uh, same way the Trident is streamlined, so it can be again it can it's it's it's, it's quite nice in the water. It's quite uh, hydrodynamic, so it it swims very well. Uh, but even then, it can't fight against really strong currents. So one way we actually use the Trident is to weight it and let it just sink to the bottom, put the motors off, let it capture data, video, and then when we're done, move it to another place without bringing it back to the surface. So essentially, sink it to the bottom, let it sit for a bit, capture video, move to another side, do the same thing, right? Uh, and that way, that's one way we use it to actually, uh, without having to deal with like strong currents, or actually having it float around. Um, again, it's also quite hard to operate. Like unlike a DJI drone, the Trident, uh, most of the underwater robots, they don't have any GPS on board. Stabilization is limited. Um, so it goes in and then you have to rely completely on what you're getting in terms of the video feed to actually operate it. Uh, and that's 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 as difficult. Um, so again, very high learning curve, but we've got some really nice photographs, video out of it as well. Uh, what we're doing now is we've attached the GoPro to it, and we're doing some uh, 3D mapping of coral reef um, mounts, uh, which is which is a lot of fun. Uh, that's again, it took some time to get to a place where we could use the Trident in that way, but I think we're almost there now. Got it. Uh, just uh, then get that. Uh product name which you mentioned regarding the another uh, underground uh, robot which you mentioned can you repeat that I just, there's a power vision there's a power okay. vision dolphin and the other one is a blue rov okay thank you so much all right and next i think we have andy andy do you have a mic if you don't i can go ahead and read that for you Okay, I will go ahead and read it. Um, so Andy says, in addition to uh, Kashish's question, what's the cable range for the Trident and have you used it for mapping as opposed to exploration? So the Trident, uh, it, the, cable, the depth is about 100 meters is what it's rated up to. The cable we have, um, you know, it's a 100 meter long cable is what is what it, you can you can purchase of the Trident store as well. Again, the Trident has been uh, deprecated as of like I think last month, so they aren't making any more of them. So if anyone's looking to buy one, they need to buy it before I think May 2021 before the company stops making them completely. Uh, saying which, going back to the question, uh, 100 meters depth is what its range is up to. Uh, the cable itself is about 100 meters long, provided by the company. I know people have modified the cable to the 300 meter, um, you know, to be 300 meters long, but there's significant lag apparently in the video feed at that point of time to have that long cable uh, going through the water. Uh, but again, like as the most, the specs wise, uh, it, if it goes below 100 meters, it's not rated for that. So I think depressurization kind of kills it then. Uh, but yeah, that's what it can do. Uh, and sorry, to answer the less text part with the mapping component, uh, we've tried again with the, even the Ladakh, we collected lots of imagery of the bottom of the lake beds uh, and stitch that into some kind of map. Again, not very high quality, both because of the camera we had as well as the lack of uh, geo reference point. But again, this has been done with the Trident where people drop in weighted um, ground control points of some kind. So these are these little disks and people in the GPS tag where they've dropped them in the water and use them to actually calibrate an image and stitch it together properly. Not something we've had to do at this point of time. Okay, great. And um, we've got Shanok again. Um, is your mic back on or do you want me to go ahead and read this one for you too? Okay, I will go ahead and read it. Um, says, can you effectively use an entry level underwater drone like chasing in turbid water? Uh, so turbid water is really hard. Um, we've had issues in terms of motor quality as well in turbid water because uh, it's interesting with the, with the Trident, with other underwater ROVs as well, to minimize the costs, these motors are exposed to the environment, right? Because they brush this motor, so they don't need to actually have the stator and the rotor connecting to operate. They just operate on, again, like induction, conduction in a sense. Um, but the... Again, the turbid water stripped the anti-corrosive material from the inside of the motor and then the salt water got to it and the motor seized up. And that was a manufacturing defect, um, again, with the motor itself because they weren't expecting turbid water to scrape off the lining. 
so aside from that component of the the motor itself, the turbid water in terms of just visibility is really hard. Uh, so again, very hard to see anything like a, like a diver, right? Like it's about like one, two, three meters away, depending on how turbid it is. Uh, saying which, it is like a diver. So if you have a case, if you have the case where you could send a diver into the water or the to to observe and you know take notes of something, and you could use a trident, you can do them. You can do the same thing with a trident. Uh, it's a lot cheaper than using a diver for any of this kind of work. Uh, again, same limitation in terms of visibility and turbidity for diving or using a robot, but uh, the Trident, most open, most ROVs can stay underwater for at least two hours, if not longer, uh, and transfer video up to the surface. Again, very little risk and uh, a lot cheaper than using a human to do it. Okay, great. Um, I have a question. So. Um, if you were torn between two different drones or ROVs, and let's say they were roughly in the same price point, not a big difference between them, are there any features that you would look to as sort of a deal breaker between the two, whether that's negative or positive? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it would be the for me at least it would be the portability, and again that's not very specific to me. Mm -hmm. It's because the kind of work, some of the work we're doing. Um, you know, it's like environmental crime monitoring. So we need to take in a drone really quietly and like use it very quietly and then leave without anyone knowing that the drone was in the air, right? And again, that a good way to do that is to just have a drone which you can put into a pocket, put into a small bag, and that that's but you're not you're not making yourself very conspicuous in that sense. So yeah, portability is almost definitely my deal breaker. Uh, the permissions, again, like I said, in other countries would be important in India. We're getting exemptions quite easily for some of our work because again, we have a track record of working with drones so we can apply to the police. We can get like a waiver of some sort or the other. Um, in other countries operating anywhere else, I think like having the permissions, the permission would be a deal breaker, like which drone am I allowed to use easily? All right, great, thank you. Um, so we still I'm for a few more questions, so if anybody has any remaining ones, go ahead and drop them in the chat or drop them into our collaborative doc. Uh, we've got about 10 to 15 minutes left. I think this may be the only Tech Tutors episode where we haven't had people just climbing over each other for questions and I mean that in such a good way because I think you did such a thorough job explaining this topic that most people's questions were probably answered in the talk. All right, it looks like we've got I, one coming in. No. Oh, go ahead, Carly. I have a point of, no, no, ask the question. I, a bunch She's of us She's still have typing a, it. <laughs> okay, a, a bunch of us are like having a side chat in the in the chat um, about like what you were talking about with the um, yeah I think like David Julian Rob and Michael. I think up on this yeah <laughs> yeah just about like yeah d ways to kind of get the device on the ground devices to connect to something that can be attached to a drone that you can then fly around to collect data. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anyone has David or Rob or Julian, if you'd like to converse out loud. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd be happy to. I just muted my mic to not interrupt the loud keyboard. <laughs> yeah, okay. Like our, we do have one more question, so let me ask this one. Um, let me get Phoebe on the mic to ask this, and then I'll let you guys. Um, have your conversation because I do think that's a good idea to it seems like there's a lot of questions surrounding what you're talking about. So Phoebe, would you like to go first? Sure. Hi, thank you for a really interesting talk, Shashank. Um, I was just wondering what your recommendations would be for what particular sort of uh, technical specifications to look at for a drone. Um, we're interested in getting quite high quality images of animals on the ground, but staying at a high yeah. altitude. And I'm not really sure which particular parts of particularly the drone camera, it would be worth looking at. We've lost Shashank. Oh, he hated the question that much. <laughs> oh no, oh no. All right, everyone, let's give it a minute and see if he can pop back in. This has never happened in a Tech Tutors episode before. Um 
I will say that we do have a couple of like drone experts, Julian, et cetera. Um, if you want to jump in and answer the question while we try and get Shashank back, that is also an option. Sure, I'd be happy to. Of places where we need the technical difficulties slide to pop up. Go ahead, take it away, save us. <laughs> um, I guess the probably the fundamental question is what what kind of ground resolution do you need to detect your animals? Um, so that's probably the starting point. Um, and from there, the, there's I mean there's a multitude of camera systems and that available. Um, it's probably unlikely that you're going to necessarily find something off the shelf. Um, that would potentially carry that camera um, in terms of like an integrated camera system. So often um, for those kind of specialist applications, you may find you have to go to something um, a bit more in the kind of commercial realm where you're, you're kind of pairing um, a camera with a, you know, with a bigger aircraft that could carry that, that payload. Um, but there's certainly cameras out there now, um, you know, small surveying cameras that are in the, you know, in the realm of, a, you know, 100 megapixel or, or greater. Um, sensor size, so it's really just pairing it with the, the right kind of focal length lens to get the ground resolution that you need. So um, um, yeah, there's there's kind of a lot of resources in that out there, but it really kind of depends on what what resolution you need on the ground to be able to detect your animals first to kind of really drive that. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, um, Shashank, is still not here. Um, I, he might be having trouble getting back in. Um, Carly, do you want to take away facilitating this chat conversation while we wait? <laughs> oh, you're muted. I think the last. I think the last thing that we like left off on was SD something about SD card to transmitter adapters, I think, right, David, Rob? Yeah, yeah. So this was a Conservation X Labs project that says they're doing something with an SD card machine learning adapter. What exactly that is is not super clear. I shot them an email to see if they have any more details. Hey, Tom, are you here? You are here, aren't you? Do you, do you have Quigley? an answer? Yeah. Uh, I don't think Tom Quigley's here. Tom Southward is Oh, is he not here? Sorry, I misread. Carly, you mentioned Tom, and I saw, I just assumed Tom is here. <laughs> um, right, right. Yeah, we, yes. we've reached out to them as well. Um, so basically, this, the, the, the principle is anything that has an SD card, so mm -hmm. a sound recorder, a camera trap, we, we want to be able to plug in uh, a, a, a kind of an adapter, if you like, that can then do a whole bunch of other things, useful things. Um, and there's a bunch of us, I think, that are interested in looking at this. Our, our project at the moment is with camera trap, but there's no reason you couldn't do it with, with anything. And um, so one way or another, I'm pretty sure this is going to progress either you know, we saw these guys and thought, well, this is basically what we're trying to do. So mm -hmm. hopefully if they've made some progress on that front, we can update everyone and tell them about where they're at. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Al Davies has written to them. I can probably chase him up about that. But um, yeah, I, I agree. I think um, that idea of having drones starting to do more and more functional work out yeah. in the environment, like having to, like you say, Carly, like traipsing through the bush to go and get camera traps or get data is one of those things that it seems like ecologists spend a lot of time doing really laborious things like going through camera trap images and if they didn't have to do those sorts of things. I mean, traipsing through the bush is nice sometimes. <laughs> um, but sometimes when it's really hot and you're yeah. unfit like me, it is not as nice. <laughs> anyway, so I can um, I can certainly keep people updated about that. That's almost certainly going to go ahead in one form or another. Um, yeah, that's... There is actually on the market now a camera trap um, plug-in system that sort of does 
what um, we're talking about. I think that the idea behind it is you plug it in to a camera trap and it basically converts it into a cell phone system. But that's obviously not particularly useful for people who don't have cell phone coverage in a particular yeah. area, which is not a camera trap. So the logical thing that we're looking at with camera trap stuff is not necessarily sending the, the images over LoRa because LoRa is not a great um, pathway for large um, files like that, but more a summary. So it would be like, you know, we saw five koalas and 10 quals or something. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not sure, Carly, like maybe you can tell us is the, the, the sound recordings, they're quite large files as well, right? Like, so. Yeah. So their WAV file, most of the devices say write to an SD card as like 20 minute or 40 minute like WAV files. So right. they're very, very large and yeah, so I know I know nothing about this. Like, I am purely the ecology conservation side of this yeah. and know nothing about anything with wires and electricity. So, like, all of the thing, all, like, the, the acronyms that are being put in the chat right now, just, like, <laughs> straight, just straight over. Um, so, yeah, and, and, but I'm, I want to learn about it. <laughs> So, can I, uh, can I yeah. ask Paul? It sounds like you've got some some uh, input here. Do you want to jump in? I think Paul Paul's just left the meeting. No, no, different Paul. Oh, oh, different Paul. Paul. Oh, yeah, Paul. Sorry. Are you there, Paul? Do you have a microphone, Paul? No, he's just going to chime in from the chat. Yeah. Am I right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think what he's talking about there is, like, basically what you were saying, Carly, was you would have a drone come in. It would be relatively close to your device. So that opens up options for things like 2.4 gigahertz, which is a very good pathway for sending large files. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's, that's what Bluetooth is. Um, and then you drone with. Did we just lose Rob? Yep. I don't know. Oh, no. no, there he is. Go on. Um, so I think I definitely agree that drones have, have a, a interesting place to play in something like this, where you could send them to your locations and just collect the data. They're already doing that with GPS data. Um, somebody mentioned, I think, um, Debbie Saunders with Wildlife Drones is already doing stuff like that, collecting mm -hmm. simultaneously, I think, actually, like flying the drone up and collecting like tens of animals' GPS data sets, which is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of possibilities. Um, watch this space. Hey, yeah, Sean. So look oh, sorry. Sorry, Julian. Oh. So I'm going to say no, it, it looks say, like... Yeah. Uh, I just looked up oh. some of the major acoustic sensor manufacturers. Their Wildlife Acoustics, their most recent hardware has Bluetooth on board already. Um, yeah. They've had they've, their implementation is basically only for configuration, but that seems like it might be something somebody could hack. I that's probably beyond me, but I think the problem with Bluetooth is range. We yeah. always run into range problems with Bluetooth, but if you use something like a, a you know, Wi-Fi based signal instead, mm -hmm. you usually can get enough range, maybe a hundred meters. Especially anything in the air is usually a bit better, but um, it depends, obviously, on things like obstruction, like yeah. canopy and that sort of stuff. But yeah, I imagine this is an area that's probably going to progress pretty quickly with conservation stuff because people just don't have the time and the money anymore to have people in the field going and collecting data. Um, yeah. Also, it can yeah. be quite dangerous in, in some circumstances. So, yeah, I definitely think this is something that's going to advance pretty quickly. 
Yeah, to Julian's point in the cut where he said, if you can still see the drone, you might as well save the headache and walk to it. I would counter that with, <laughs> you can see pretty far over, like, but still have to go up and down gorges and cross rivers and, like, the, it still can be... Yeah, I agree. Yeah, advantageous. Yeah. Sorry, can I... Can I pause you guys? I think Shashank might be back with us. I think okay. he's yeah, here. Yeah. I've been in and out of the meeting for the past five, ten minutes um, with yeah. different devices. Hello? Oh, <laughs> yeah. hello. Yeah, so I've been listening to the discussion about um, the audio mod Bluetooth, the new one, and actually moving it back and forth. Uh, so yeah, fascinating, really. And I completely agree with Kali about you can you might be able to. Uh, see very far but you're still having to go through all these like different obstacles to get where you want to and like Ladakh is a prime example where you can actually use drones to look over mountains where to take like a day or so to actually go around them otherwise uh, but yeah that's just I, I really enjoying this bit about because in India at least we don't have the same issue because there's a lot of rural phone connectivity even at 2G or 3G levels uh, especially in the last like two or three years so most people I know working on camera traps are just using phone networks um, for the most part. But yeah, we haven't had this. We don't have the same issue with drones, with needing drones for this kind of work at this point of time. But yeah. All right. Now that we have you back, um, everyone, that is the hour. So if everyone has to go, that's totally fine. But we do tend to hang around after the episodes for a while. So feel free to keep asking your questions. Um, Shashank, if you're happy to stay for longer and keep taking yeah. questions, uh, we would be glad to have you. Um, but we will officially end the recording in just a second. So thank you, everyone who attended. Uh, this was a good episode, despite the temporary chaos. I'm glad we had some people here in the chat who could take over while we were solving that. It's very handy to have so many, <laughs> so many experts on board. Um, and we will see you all next week, hopefully.